Welcome back to Lab Rat Scientific. Now, I've been pretty busy the last couple of weeks developing this test apparatus to help me design a small hydroelectric generator. Now, in this episode, the first of a series of two is going to focus on the electrical components and generating the necessary torques needed to get the system to work. Now, in the follow-on episode, I'll be looking at the actual water wheel and the overall system to see if I can actually generate electricity using water. Well, without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started and look at the electrical components and the mechanical system to see how it all works. And before I get into details, I want to talk about some safety aspects. Now, as you can see, my apparatus involves chains and sprockets. So there's obviously a severe pinch hazard, so I have to be very careful when I use it. I'm also using 12 volts and electrical components, which can cause some shock hazards. I'm also using 12 volt car batteries, which can provide very high currents, which could cause fires or severe burns if you're not careful. So don't attempt these experiments without proper background knowledge and proper supervision. Here's my experimental setup. I've got a permanent magnet alternator, and that's being driven by this bicycle wheel. And I've got a V-belt attached to the bicycle wheel that runs around a pulley on the alternator. And a large diameter bicycle wheel and a small diameter pulley on the alternator allow me to spin the alternator pretty fast. Now the alternator is attached to a bridge rectifier. And it converts the AC voltage coming out of the alternator into a DC voltage. It then goes to a DC to DC converter to give me a nice steady 12 volts out of the system. Now that 12 volts is then fed to a charge controller, which charges up my batteries. And these batteries are used to power a inverter, which converts the 12 volts from the battery into 120 volts AC power that can run a power drill, a house fan, or light bulbs. Here's a block diagram of the components you just saw. First, there's the alternator, and it produces a three-phase AC voltage. And the voltage level is dependent on the spin rate of the alternator. Now, the AC voltage is fed to the bridge rectifier, which converts the AC voltage into a DC voltage. But that voltage is still dependent on the speed of the alternator. Now, that DC voltage is fed to a 12-volt regulator, which produces a steady 12-volt DC output. And that output is fed to the charge controller, which is used to charge the 12 volt car battery. Now that 12 volt car battery produces a 12 volt DC output, which has a high current rating. And that's used to power the power inverter, which converts the 12 volts into 115 volt AC 60 Hertz power. The modern automobile alternator includes a bridge rectifier and 12 volt regulator and outputs 12 volts DC. However, for systems like a water generator or a wind turbine, it's best to have the alternator outputting an AC voltage that allows you to transmit the voltage over longer distances. And transmitting AC voltage is more efficient than transmitting DC voltage. Now the alternator needs to spin at a certain spin rate to be able to generate the 12 volts I need for my system to work. Now to get the proper spin rate on my alternator, I've got it attached to a V-belt, which is attached to a large diameter wheel. So for every rotation of a large wheel, the smaller pulley on the alternator spins faster. Now if I take the circumference of a large wheel and the circumference of my pulley, I can determine the pulley ratio. In the setup I have here, that ratio is 8 to 1. So for every revolution of the wheel, I get 8 revolutions on the pulley on the alternator. Now let's take a look at the math and see how we calculate that ratio. Here's how we calculate the pulley ratio. First, we look at the big wheel, and it has a radius of 0.28 meters. We calculate the circumference, which is pi times diameter, and that comes out to be 1.76 meters. Then we look at the pulley radius, and that's 0.035 meters, and calculate the circumference of the pulley, which comes out to be 0.22 meters. You see, if we take the ratio of those two, 1.76 divided by 0.22, we get a ratio of 8.0. Now, we could simply just take the radii and divide those to one another and get the same ratio. Now what that means is that when the big wheel rotates one time, the pulley and alternator will rotate eight times. Now let's spin things up and see how it works. I've got a 12 volt light bulb attached to the system. So as I spin the system up, you should see the light bulb in the right hand side of the screen illuminate. So I simply crank on the bicycle pedals, the bicycle wheel starts spinning, in turn it spins the alternator and generates electricity. If I stop rotating things, the light bulb goes off, and I start spinning up again, See the light bulb comes on. Here you can see the voltage being generated in my multimeter. If I start spinning things up, you'll see the voltage increase. Now if I'm going too slow, I'm not getting 12 volts. But if I spin fast enough, you see I reach 12 volts, 
And because of that DC to DC converter, it will hold a steady 12 volts no matter how fast I spin the system after that. That gives me a nice steady 12 volt DC output of the system. Now to properly size the water wheel to make sure the whole system will work, I've got to understand the torques involved with spinning the alternator. Now the alternator will be more difficult to spin as the electrical load increases. So if I have one light bulb, it'll take a certain amount of torque to spin the alternator. If I put two or three or four light bulbs on it, it'll actually be more difficult to rotate. The torque requirement will increase. Now I'll be able to determine the torques required by making some simple measurements on the pulley and the wheel. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna attach a string and do a simple pull test to determine the force required to get the whole system to rotate. I can take that force times the radius of the wheel or the radius of the pulley and determine the required torque. So let's go ahead and take a look at those experiments. Here's a test I'll be conducting. First of all, I have my alternator here, which is free to rotate on its own. It's not connected to the drive wheel with a belt. However, the alternator is connected to a 12 volt light bulb to give some electrical load. Now during a test, what I'll do is apply a force to the tangent of the pulley on the alternator and using a load cell measure the force that's required to rotate the alternator to generate the 12 volts to illuminate the light bulb. Now the radius of the pulley is 0 0.5 zero three five meters and I'll use that to calculate the moment required or the torque required to rotate the alternator. Here's a pull test on the alternator. Here's the results from the alternator pull test. First of all I did tests with no electrical load. These I made multiple runs and got a rough average of about 17 newtons. If I can calculate the torque required to rotate the alternator is multiplying 17 newtons by 0 0.035 meters, and that gave a torque of 0 0.6 newton meters. I then applied an electrical load, the 12 volt light bulb, and repeated the test. And here you can see I got a rough average of about 25 newtons. Now this initial hump is where I have to try to accelerate the system, but this is sort of the steady state pull of 25 newtons. Again, I can calculate the required torque for the loaded alternator, I multiply 25 newtons by 0 0.035 meters and I get a torque of 0 0.9 newton meters. Here's a diagram of the test I just conducted. Here's my alternator and here's a 25 newton force that was required to get it to rotate. Now I can apply that force at any tangent along the pulley. And if I attach a belt between the pulley and the wheel, I can see that that force is transmitted along the belt. So that belt has to pull with a 25 newton force to get the alternator to rotate. Now that force is transmitted around the wheel and I can actually apply a force at the top of the wheel of 25 newtons and create a torque that's required to rotate the alternator. That torque is calculated by multiplying the 25 newtons times the radius of the wheel, which is 0 0.28 meters. So torque is force times distance, 25 newtons times 0 0.28 meters gives a torque of 7.0 newton meters. Now that is a theoretical torque that must be provided by the wheel to get the alternator to spin. This assumes no friction or mechanical losses. I can repeat the pull test, except this time pulling on the wheel itself. What I want to do is to see if I can get that 25 newton force required to rotate the alternator. Here are the results of the pull test on the wheel. Now with no electrical load, I got a rough average of about 20 newtons required to pull at the top of the wheel to get the alternator to rotate. And that gives a torque of 5.6 newton meters. Now here's the same test with the small electrical load, the 12 volt light bulb attached to the system. You see I got a rough average of about 32 newtons. Now that's greater than the 25 newtons predicted by theory for a frictionless system. You see that my torque is 32 newtons times 0 0.28 meters for the radius of the wheel. And that gives a torque of 9.0 newton meters. So here's a comparison of the theoretical versus actual results. The theoretical torque with a non-frictional system should require a seven newton meter torque on the large wheel. However, the measured torque was 9.0 newton meters. So this means that approximately 33% more torque is required to overcome belt and bearing friction that is present in the system. This serves as a baseline design factor when designing a water wheel or a wind turbine to spin the alternator. As a minimum, an additional 33% more torque must be applied to overcome friction and mechanical losses. These tests also demonstrated that as electrical load is added to the system, the torque required to get things spinning increases. Now here's a test result from the alternator by itself. 
With no load, it took a torque of 0.6 newton meters to get the system spinning up to the proper velocity. When we loaded the alternator with a 12 volt light bulb, it took 0.9 newton meters. And then when we shifted to pull on the wheel, the no load torque was 5.6 newton meters. And when the wheel was loaded with a 12 volt light bulb, it took 9.0 newton meters to spin the system. Now this means that approximately 50% more torque is required even with a relatively small electrical load. As more electrical load is applied, more torque will be required. So you need to factor this into the wheel design. Now that we understand what torques are involved with getting the system to rotate, the next step is to design our water wheel. Here's the water wheel I'll be designing. It's 1.0 meters in diameter, and the water is fed in from the top. Now as water pours in, it fills up various compartments of the wheel and starts it rotating. Now as the wheel rotates, the water spills out towards the bottom. Now by examining the geometry of the wheel, we can see that five compartments are filled at any given time. Now here's my water wheel. It's 0.5 meters in radius, and it has 15 compartments. Now it's the weight of the water in the compartments that makes the wheel spin. So what I need to do is calculate the weight of the water in each compartment. Now you notice in the diagram, the compartments are assumed not to be 100% full. And if I assume that each of those compartments holds a right triangular wedge of water, I can approximate the volume. So water volume is the area of a triangle times the width. So that's one half base times height times the width. And the volume comes out to be 0.0023 cubic meters. I can calculate the weight of the water by multiplying the density times the volume, and you see I get 22.7 newtons of water in each of the first four compartments. Now for estimating purposes, it's assumed that the weight of the water is the same in compartments one, two, three, and four, but the weight of the water in compartment five is estimated to be 50% of the others because the water starts spilling out as the rotation gets towards the bottom. Now to verify my approximated weight is correct, I've taken the volume of water, 0.0023 meters cubed, which is actually 2.3 liters, and put that amount of water in a bucket after nulling out the weight of the bucket and use a load cell to measure the weight. And sure enough, it came out to be 22.7 newtons. So my volume calculation and my water weight calculation seems to be reasonable. Next, we need to determine the torque provided by each cell of water. Now, since gravity is providing the force needed to rotate the wheel, the moment arm used is the horizontal distance from the axis of rotation of the wheel to the center of gravity of each cell of water. Now, here I'm approximating the center of gravity locations. And here are the values I've determined. Now, to calculate the total supplied torque, I need to sum the torques provided by each cell of water. If I do the math, you'll see the total supplied torque is 26.5 newton meters. Now tests showed that the torque required to spin the loaded alternator was only 9.0 newton meters, but the water wheel can supply a torque of 26.5 newton meters. This means the water wheel design is capable of providing three times the torque needed to spin the alternator. Now this excess torque is important due to the fact that as the electrical load increases, in other words, more light bulbs are added, the torque requirement will also increase. There will also be mechanical losses due to friction in the mechanisms, the bearings, the belts, etc that will reduce the effective torque in the system. So excess torque is important. All right, so now let's verify that the 26.5 Newton meters of torque that can be generated by the water wheel is sufficient to turn the system. So what I've got in my experimental setup, I have a one meter beam attached to my wheel, and I have 26.5 Newtons of rocks hanging from that beam. So one meter times 26.5 newtons gives me the torque of 26.5 newton meters. The same thing as the water wheel can generate. And just by feeling it, if I lower the bucket quickly, it looks like there's ample torque available to drive the system. So it looks like my water wheel should work. Now we're going to have to see how fast we have to spin the alternator to get our 12 volt DC output. Now let's see what kind of rotation rates required to generate the 12 volts. You're generating 10 or 11 volts DC. And here we are getting 12 volts DC. Again, that's the DC voltage coming out of the DC to DC converter. So a nice stable 12.1 volts output. And if I spin up faster, you see that the voltage holds steady at 12.1 volts. 
You're getting the benefit of the regulator. I can determine the rotational rate of this large wheel by looking at the video. Now, by examining that video, I see that it took approximately 12 seconds for this wheel to rotate five times to generate the 12 volts I need. So if I take five revolutions divided by 12 seconds, I get 0.42 revolutions per second. Now, the spin rate of the wheel when it's attached to the water wheel will depend on the amount of water entering the water wheel. But I'm going to worry about that later on in episode two. Now, one last item of interest that's stuck in my mind. How efficient will this system be at converting rotational mechanical energy into electrical energy? Well, let's take a look at some simple equations to see if we can get an idea. Now, to approximate the overall system efficiency, we first need to look at the mechanical rotational power. Now, power is equal to torque times angular velocity. Now, from earlier, we determined that the water wheel will generate a torque of 26.5 newton meters. Multiply that by the angular velocity, which was 0.42 revolutions per second, in order to generate the 12.1 volts. Now, if I convert that angular velocity to radians per second, it comes out to be 2.63. So the power output from a mechanical perspective is 69.9 watts. Next, we look at the electrical power, and power is equal to current times voltage. Now, I have a power meter attached to the system, so I directly measured 6.1 watts to run the 12-volt light bulb. Now, if I divide 6.1 watts by 69.9 watts, I get something on the order of 10%. So this says that the system is only 10% efficient in converting mechanical power into electrical power. So where do these energy and power losses come from? Well, first of all, the mechanical bearing and belt friction reduces efficiency. And then the conversion of rotational energy into AC electrical energy in the alternator also results in significant losses. Then there's converting the alternator output to a DC voltage via the bridge rectifier. This involves the electrical losses in the form of heat. And then there's converting the DC voltage into 115 volts AC via the inverter. This also results in electrical losses in the form of heat. Yikes, that number is pretty bad. A 10% efficiency is really low. If I had to pedal this bicycle to create my electricity, I'd spend more money on food and water than I would saving on my power bill. Now, However, if I'm using water to run the system, it can run continuously and I don't have to pay for that water. So actually this system might not be quite so bad. However, 10% is pretty low. Now there are commercial small hydroelectric stations that can get higher efficiencies. Again, this is a very crude system, so obviously the efficiency is gonna be low. Well, that's it for this first episode. Now hopefully I've given you some useful insights on how to develop your own home-built water-driven power generating system. And even if you don't want to create a power generating system, hopefully I've given you some insights on how to assess a mechanical system to look at things like torques and forces to get the thing to work. Now in the second episode, I'm going to talk about the actual water wheel and put the whole thing together to see if I can actually generate electricity using water. Well, I hope to see you next time at Labrat Scientific.